uh, jump right in, so don't go anywhere because you don't want to miss the next talk. Um, so now we're switching gears a little bit and we're going to talk about solar system chronology. Um, and the next talk is going to be uh, given by the eminent Dave Draper again. <laughs> I could have said Reverend Doctor. <laughs> Reverend Doctor. <laughs> I'm back. No, I promise this is the last talk I'm giving. You don't have to hear me again. That, can I get some extra time for that? <laughs> okay, uh, uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, sampling some of the youngest basalts we think uh, we know of on, on the lunar near side. Uh, before I do that, of course, I have to give Sam equal time. The reason he's not here, young Master Lawrence here. Uh, Sam uh, just texted me a little while ago to say that Kyle is already doing his first digital uh, elevation map, so he's, <laughs> Apple's not falling too far from that tree. Uh, so here's an outline of where we're going. We're advocating a sample return from some of the youngest basalts in Oceanus Procolarum. Uh, the mission would provide calibration uh, for model surface ages. And you know, we all talk about an elevator pitch for, for mission concepts and so forth. This is, I don't even need an elevator ride. This is a bumper sticker pitch. Go get the youngest basalts, bring them back, measure the ages, fix the crater count curve. That's it. Um, in addition, when you bring those samples back, you get information on composition, mineralogy, textures, physical properties in addition to the radiometric ages. And this will help us understand not only the chronology of the, of the, uh, of the moon and, and the surf, uh, lavas exposed on the surface, but thermal and magmatic evolution over time as well. We reckon that terrestrial laboratories are the best place to do this just because of the precision that we can bring to the problem. This is a, a photograph of our, our landing zone that we're going to be looking at in a little more detail in the you know, subsequent slides. It's south of the Aristarchus Plateau. We've had a lot of talks about this region uh, for other, other purposes here in the workshop. Um, the main thing to take away from this image is just uh, it's a very benign surface on which to land. Now, we all know space flight is hard. Landing a, a spacecraft on another world is hard. But within that realm, this landing site is probably the least challenging in the solar system. So it's, uh, and fortunately, it has uh, some great stuff to tell us. And not so far away from here, of course, there are a couple of US spacecraft still sitting on the lunar surface. This is Apollo 12 landing site, and on the other side, uh, Surveyor 3, uh, which they named this Surveyor Crater. So we've done this. We'd like to do it again. Um, we think this is something we can definitely do. Uh, it would not take a huge amount of additional instrumentation and uh, space flight hardware development. Um, the Russians have done it three times. Now let's, let's give Sam a little slack here for his third bullet. He's maybe a little grumpy. He's got, he and Julie have a newborn at home. Don't judge. Um, but, you know, we should be able to do this. Um, we also want to keep up this momentum that, that is, is we're all enjoying right now about the moon. It's a great uh, strike while the iron is hot. Um, we're leveraging data from LRO, as I mentioned in my little uh, uh, spiel before I gave Julie's talk. It would also establish a capability for powered descent on airless bodies. All of these things are extremely valuable. Our uh, notional uh, mission concept, as I just said, has a very clear objective. You can put it on a bumper sticker. Um, it will give a very unambiguous result when you bring those samples back and measure the ages and their compositions. And uh, it, it is not just applicable to the moon. It is going to help us understand the history of the entire inner solar system, any rocky surface. As we all know, the lunar crater count curve is the only game in town for estimating the ages of exposed rocky surfaces on, on, on these planets. It's used on Mercury, it's used on Mars, they used it on Pluto, I mean, yet they tweaked it and so forth, but um, this, this needs to be uh, addressed. It also is a complement to human exploration. Let's take Mars as an example. Um, when, when it is finally decided that we're going to put humans on the Martian surface, absolutely crucial fact we're going to want to know is how old is the surface we're going to put those astronauts on. And again, because we have this somewhat uncertain uh, uh, chronology curve using crater size frequency distributions, um, the uh, uh, uncertainty on the age of, let's say, a, a billion-year-old surface or a billion-and-a-half-year-old surface on Mars right now is about a billion years, and we'd like to know that age to a whole lot better precision than that. Okay, it is also, this concept is also responsive to many of the community's goals. It's a comparatively low-risk, high-reward mission. 
Um, it addresses numerous priorities in the scientific context for the exploration of the moon document, for the decadal survey, for uh, PSD and uh, SMDs and, and the agency's science plan. Uh, there's a few bullet points here that list some of the ways we do this, understanding the evolution of lunar interior, understanding the, the flux of Mari volcanism through time, uh, and uh, improving the absolute chronology for the inner solar system, as I was just saying. Okay, um, we're arguing that this is best done in terrestrial laboratories, with all due respect to my, uh, the, some of the talks that are going to follow this one, advocating for in situ work. Um, uh, because we can do such more precise measurements in terrestrial laboratories, uh, we, can, we can get that ball further down the field. Um, also, bringing the samples back gives us access to some of the features that are impossible to do in situ, the really, really high resolution stuff. Um, everything from solar wind implantation and the development of nanophase iron, uh, development of patinas on uh, particles exposed at the airless body surface. These are things that you've just got to do in terrestrial laboratories. It's ground truth for orbital measurements, as we all know. That's uh, one of the great things about the rich samples and data sets we have from the moon. There's, it's possible to correlate all these things. Um, we can uh, take advantage of additional analytical techniques as they're developed. We, we've all seen uh, in recent years how that has uh, happened with uh, measurements of water in both picritic lunar glass beads and within uh, minor phases like appetite. And, uh, you know, the gifts that keep on giving. Anytime we can dream up something new to interrogate these samples about, they're right there waiting for us. And, of course, uh, uh, the expertise and of JSE's curation uh, group is a testament to the fact that we are still making these uh, amazing discoveries 45, 50 years later is um, a testament to the skill that they do that. Yeah, I know I'm biased, but again, I'm, I'm also right. <laughs> uh, this is a fairly clean version of a diagram we've seen several times, the, the crater count curve. It uh, shows the uh, size, frequency distributions of particular uh, uh, craters here on the vertical axis against age along the horizontal. And uh, this is just has one curve drawn in it. This is from Stoffler and Ryder in 2001. We've seen versions of this diagram that have all the families of curves on them, right? And you can see big hole in, right here in the middle. If we had a really well-determined data point somewhere in there, we could eliminate many, many curves from the families of permissive solutions to this, uh, to this set of data. <clears throat> okay, well, anything else on you see here? Right. Well, also, and that we don't know the uh, young ages here as well as we know some of these other ones. Also, we don't have a representative uh, uh, collection with respect to the compositions. And we now know from our remotely sensed data sets that have been acquired in the years since Apollo that uh, there are compositions on the lunar surface that we don't have uh, in our collections. Pink spinel, you know, is a great example of that. Um, it's a, and we all know that these are the windows into the interior of, of the moon, or any uh, planet. And this is going to help us ground truth remote sensed uh, observations. We've seen this map before too. This is from Harry Hiesinger's work, showing some of the uh, mapped uh, uh, lava flows with respect to their ages. Uh, the one that we're going to be focusing on here is in the bright orange. This is what Harry has termed P60. Uh, we've seen uh, other ways of estimating this map. I believe Junichi showed uh, a, a diagram similar to this one. And the, the, the numbers are different, but it still comes out as one of the youngest ones. And uh, as I showed in that early uh, image of our, our target landing zone, it's really, really benign. Uh, compositionally, it's very heterogeneous, it, or excuse me, homogeneous. Um, the, the, the upshot there is we could probably get away without having to do really high precision landing. We could, we could, we could accept a, a larger ellipse, a landing ellipse, because no matter where we are there, we're going to get the stuff we need to do this work when we bring the samples home. Here's P60 uh, zoomed up a little more. Now, I don't know how well you can see some of the subtle details here. Uh, th this is the area that we're targeting in the orange box. This is the Aristarchus Plateau that we just heard about a little while ago, which, I, by the way, let's go there again and again and again. I love the Aristarchus Plateau. Um, again, with uh, uh, LRO data in hand, we are able to certify this landing site very well for uh, engineering safety. Um, Sam has told me that when he tried to calculate the flatness of this surface, the, a lot of the equations just blow up because it's too flat. 
So it's, it's probably no more steep than about a half a degree, and that's good news. All right, here's another image uh, without, the, um, without the outline, and this shows the, the, in the little white circle here the uh, area that we're trying to target. Again, I doubt you can see this in the brightly lit room, but it's uh, in between some prominent rays coming off the plateau here. Now, of course, we're going we're gonna to get fragments from Aristarchus, but those should be um, straightforward to identify in comparison with the Mari basalt that will make up the bulk of the return sample. So the goal here, our mission philosophy is to, and we've been working on this for a couple of years now already, is to uh, uh, submit this as a discovery proposal. And uh, obviously doing sample return on DISCO dollars is a challenge, but and we're working that really hard and uh, we hope to be able to give a green light to go ahead with this very soon. Um, however, in order to do that, that means you have to live with a, a very simple uh, spacecraft. Um, no Christmas trees here. You have one job, land, pick up the stuff, come home. Uh, so we can do this with a single landed element with an automated uh, sample collection and return capability. Uh, the near side landing site is, is helpful for executing uh, the, the, the mission. Don't need a relay satellite. Um, we can, of course, we want as much sample as we can carry, but we can get away with hundreds of grams and still uh, answer the scientific mail here. And we can do all this in less than one lunar day. Uh, our mission concept would propose landing in the early lunar morning, uh, doing all the work and, and launching the return vehicle uh, before lunar noon. So we wouldn't have to worry about getting through the hot part of the day, nor would we have to worry about um, going overnight. And I think I have just my last slide right here. Um, we think that this is a, a comparatively straightforward mission. It's very valuable. Obviously, we're not the ones who, who first realized that we really need to fix the crater count curve by measuring the ages of the youngest basalts. Um, but we think that we can get this done in a relatively cost-effective way. It addresses many fundamental planetary science questions. Uh, we have the data in hand from LRO and other assets to really understand the landing site. And the science implications for doing this are not just for the moon, but they'll help the entire inner solar system's uh, understanding. So, on behalf of Sam Lawrence, I thank you. Any questions? Carly. Um, I understand the general logic for why you want to stay away from the rays of Aristarchus, but why don't you turn it around the other way? Think of Apollo 12, where that's how we got the age of Copernicus. So why not go there, because you'll be easy to separate that from the basalt. It's a great question, and of course you're 100% right. It's really a question of, I would anticipate reviewers saying, how are you going to know you got enough stuff of what you went there to get, the young basalt? That's, we have one job, remember. However, I would argue that I think we'll probably get some of these other lithologies in there. And we all know how much we can extract out of really small pieces of material from elsewhere than the spot it's collected, right? So that's kind of, that's kind of where our mindset is. Yeah, and also that site, part of the selection of that site is that it's a, a, a perfect calibration for the CSFD collecting the craters. If you go somewhere else on there, then it's contaminated by secondaries. So that was part of the logic for picking it there is that, you know, the, the key science goal here is calibration for the CSFD. Yeah, right. but you just need some serious samples. Yeah, but you're also, you have to get your crater counts, right, right where the sample came from. It's a bit anal retentive. And probably if what you said, you went over there and you just say, well, we're going to take the count over here and assume the units are the same, you're probably okay. But that's just, I'm not advocating either, but that's part of the logic. Yeah, well, me too, me too. But it is really, we want to be, we all know how hard it is to get selected in, in, these, in these things. And so we want, to, we want to have a laser focus on the goal. Do I have time for yes. Justin's question? Yes. Okay. Well, there you are. I'm sorry. All right. I'm working behind you. <laughs> yeah, not, not, not a question. I just wanted to reiterate um, uh, the point, which is, although it's exciting to get the diversity of lithology, sometimes when you are dealing with ray material or, or other things, subtle effects are, are blind to us when we actually make the chrono chronological measurements. And so having the purest, cleanest sample and a bunch of examples of that, bunch of examples of that is, is going to give us a more robust, a more confident age uh, constraint. So if that's the number one goal, that's what we want to do. A more complex, uh, it, it, it's, it's easy, it's not easy to separate subtle, cryptic effects. What he said. 
isotopic measurements. Great, thank you. Thanks. Thanks. All right, now that Dave has captivated you all in this new topic, I'm going to take just a second to introduce myself before our next speaker. Um, I'm Deborah Needham. I'm at Marshall Space Flight Center, and I'm a planetary scientist trained in volcanology, but I love all of these sites, and we definitely need to go to all of them. So with that, <laughs> I would like to uh, introduce our next speaker, Dr. David Kring, and he'll be talking about uh, landing at lunar impact craters and impact basins to determine the bombardment of ancient Earth. Thank you, Deborah. Um, so I want to not advocate a single uh, landing site uh, here. I want to talk about a class of landing sites um, for the commercial providers with the hope that they can uh, implement uh, this type of concept. And the idea is to collect impact uh, lithologies and bring them back to Earth. So this is a sample return uh, mission uh, concept. OK, so I need to, I want to be, for this audience, I'm, I'm, try, I'm not trying to assume you know too much uh, for the commercial provider, so I want to actually start with some basics about lunar history. Uh, you can put together lunar history in a couple of different ways, and, and the first way that we approached this in the pre-Apollo days was using an orbital perspective, and we provided, we were able to obtain a history from, I hate this thing. Um, from the bottom of the diagram are the oldest part of the lunar history to the top of the diagram is the youngest part of the lunar history. And this history was put together by um, stratigraphy of overlapping impact ejecta blankets and lava flows and the relative densities of impact craters on surfaces. The older the surface, the more craters that are on it. In parallel with that, you'll see the uh, chronology that we have for the Earth. Uh, Jack Schmidt yesterday made reference to a period of bombardment being equivalent to the Hadean on the Earth, and you can see at the bottom of this diagram, uh, the lunar diagram, and corresponding Hadean period uh, on the Earth uh, diagram. Okay, so there is another way of addressing lunar history, and that's to go to the moon and collect samples. And so here's Jack collecting a sample. Uh, and you bring them back to Earth, and you begin analyzing uh, the ages. Now, there's two classes of, of impact lithologies uh, that were brought back. There were some lithologies that we have tentatively uh, linked to specific basin forming event, events. Uh, and what I've listed here are, in stratigraphic order, um, are events uh, from, again, the oldest, Nectaris, in this diagram, to Orientale, which is the last of the basin forming impact events. And the, the first thing I want to point out is the size of these impact events, okay? So these are, these are 300 uh, kilometers in size to 1,200 kilometers in size. And you're going to say, well, what does that number mean? Well, just as a reminder, uh, Chicxulub, the dinosaur-killing impact event that wiped most life off the planet of the Earth, is a puny 180-kilometer impact. So these are monster impact events that were affecting uh, the lunar surface and by proxy uh, the Earth's surface. Now, uh, because of the careful sample collection that was done, uh, we think we can assign some samples to some of these basins. And I want to first of all point out that this is a historical chart. This is actually about 20 years old. Uh, there is some discussion as to whether, for example, Serenitatis should be in this uh, location, the diagram. And these ages are the ages that we had about 20 years ago. We're still fiddling with these ages uh, and, and uh, as techni techniques uh, to analyze the samples uh, improve. Okay. The other way of addressing this is to simply analyze every single impact melt sample you can get your hands on in that collection and then plot up a histogram. Uh, and this was also done uh, here, for example, some Apollo 14 ages, some Apollo 16 ages, 17 ages, all in argon-argon, and then some Euripidean strontium ages on the bottom. And uh, on this diagram, 4.4 is on this side and 3.6 is over here. And you see there's kind of a spike. There's a pile up of ages around 3.3 nine to four billion years ago. Uh, and this was uh, recognized by Grimble Turner in the Argon-Argon system and then by uh, Jerry Wasserberg's group in the uranium lead system. And it was inferred from this data that there was a lunar cataclysm, an intense period of bombardment on the lunar surface. And they called that the lunar cataclysm hypothesis. And so diagrammatically, that's what this looks like. This is a plotting of the flux of impacting asteroids and comets as a function of time uh, from now, initially, when the Earth and the Moon was forming, the impact rate was high, and then it fell off at some uh, point uh, to where it is today. Now, based on the Apollo samples uh, that were collected, there was this spike. And I have to say, we still 
argue about the magnitude and duration of that spike, which is why you see three representative curves here. Now, for the astrobiologists in the audience, this is really an intriguing event because it immediately precedes the earliest isotopic evidence of life on our planet, so that begs the question, is there some connection? Okay, so uh, uh, I proposed many years ago what I call the impact origin hypothesis. The largest of these basins would have actually made uh, conditions for life completely untenable at the surface. The seas would have been completely vaporized. There would have been a rock vapor atmosphere. Life simply could not have persisted. On the other hand, these very same impact events would have produced vast subsurface hydrothermal systems, which would have been perfect crucibles for the early evolution of life. And why might we think that that's a suitable place for life? Oh, before I get to that, uh, just to illustrate how bad it was on the Hadean Earth, uh, this is a, a movie that uh, Simone Marchi did for us when he was an intern, I mean a, a postdoc funded by uh, NLSI and or Survey, I don't remember which, uh, working with Bill Bakke and myself. This is, if you map what happened on the moon to the Earth, this is the early Earth. This is the Hadean. Um, it was a, in some sense, miserable place. You really can't talk about the early evolution of the planet without talking about this impact uh, flux. Okay, so let's go on. Uh, all right, so the early Earth was like this. We had these impact events vaporizing the seas. The seas eventually recover, and hopefully life is uh, getting its start uh, beneath that surface. Now again, why might we think this is an appropriate place for biology to um, get going? That is because my biological colleagues, if I can get this slide to go, there we go, uh, looking at ribosoma RNA suggests that the uh, tree of life is rooted in a community of organisms that are thermophiles or hypothermophiles, exactly the type of organisms that would uh, thrive in an impact crater hydrothermal uh, system. Okay, so. That's all a lot of supposition on a wonderful data set uh, brought back uh, by the Apollo astronauts, but we're still working in the state of poor environment. We really need to get back to the, surf to the lunar surface and bring back samples to test this in greater detail. Okay, so this is not something um, uh, I'm, I'm making up. This is something the community has long realized. You heard about this yesterday. This is the number one priority in the NRC 2007 uh, report uh, that we heard about. Uh, the bombardment history of the inner solar system uniquely revealed on the moon, and in fact, I, uh, item A is to test the cataclysm hypothesis. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, there's three paths forward. Use existing samples and spacecraft data to further test the hypotheses, and we're doing that, obviously. Second, prepare for future robotic and crewed expeditions to the lunar surface, which is what I'm going to focus on uh, today. Okay, so where would you do that? Oh, okay, so there are target requirements that you have to be aware of. You can't just simply land anywhere on the lunar surface to do that. Uh, to determine the impact flux and energy variations in it, we need to target impact craters in larger basins that are representative of the flux in space, that is geographically and in time. Also, to provide a temporarily broad chronometer, we also need to target impact craters that provide surfaces that is, crater floors that can be used to calibrate crater counting chronologies, which we just heard a discussion of a moment ago, and target impact craters that provide stratigraphic horizons, that is, ejected blankets that can be used for relative uh, chronologies. Now, here is the same uh, uh, list of uh, basins that I showed earlier uh, with some tentative uh, chronology assignments. And if we were to look at select a representative number one, uh, number of them, they are indicated in these yellow arrows. I think if we went to these sites and got those data that we would have this uh, uh, understood fairly well. I would say that Schrodinger and Orientale are way at the top because these are the youngest basins, the least complicated of the uh, target sites. But there's more, as they say. Oh, and here's this geographic distribution that shows uh, where they are, are located. Okay, but there's more. There are pre-nectarian basins. There is an older set of basins for which we have zero data. Two-thirds of the basins are unknown, completely unknown. 
And the oldest of them is the South Pole Aiken Basin, which we have heard a little bit about uh, yesterday. And so that is, in fact, the highest priority as articulated not only by the NRC 2007 report, but also articulated in the uh, decadal survey. So that would be our highest priority uh, for this uh, range of basins. Uh, but again, we want to um, have a, a, a variety of basins from that area. So we would not only want to do the South Bolaken Basin, we'd probably want to do Smith Eye, we'd want to do Apollo, and my circle is in the wrong place. It should be over uh, Nubium. Again, getting some geographic and chronological uh, variation. Uh, so that would be represented here. If we got those four basins, I think we'd better understand the cadence of impact events uh, in the pre-Nectarian. There's, uh, after uh, the uh, Imbrium form, we have the Erastenian. Uh, again, we don't have any data uh, for impact events of this age, so we need to get uh, some representative ones uh, on the lunar surface. Here, for example, are five that would, I think, uh, help us uh, uh, determine the cadence during the Erastenian. And these, uh, and then finally, we have the Copernican. Uh, we have some insights as to what the some ages may be, but these are somewhat tentative. In fact, Jack uh, has suggested that the data that we use for uh, determining the age of Tycho may be incorrectly assigned. That may be the age of a fault as opposed to the Tycho impact event. And to say this another way, to say this another way, the A in this period, um, we only have one. Uh, single impact event that is relative, or let me say that another way. During the Phanerozoic, when complex life evolved on Earth, we only have one lunar age, and that's maybe, that's Tycho. If Jack's right, we don't even know uh, Tycho. So there is a lot of uh, uncertainty with regard to the chronology in the last uh, billion years on the moon and therefore uh, on Earth history. So we would want to look at a series of them uh, and I think uh, nail that uh, down. Okay, so in conclusion, representative complex craters and multi-ring basins can be sampled to test the lunar cataclysm hypothesis. I didn't go into this, but this really is an inner solar system cataclysm hypothesis. It's just not the Earth and the Moon. These samples will provide a measure of the impact flux and its variations throughout lunar history. These same impact sites will provide an opportunity to explore the crust of the Moon in the form of exposed cross-sections. It's another facet that I didn't go into because of time. Uh, but the punchline, I think, is what I think would excite the public, uh, something that the uh, commercial uh, providers could uh, uh, take advantage of, is that these same uh, sample return missions will provide a window into the events that shape the geologic and biologic evolution of our own planet. Thank you. Excellent summary, uh, David. Uh, I just would, I keep trying to, uh, without much traction, uh, bring to the attention of the community the vast importance of clay during the Hadean mm -hmm. as a potential scaffold for the organization of complex molecules and a way in which complex molecules, at least broadly distributed, can survive that kind of uh, impact flux that we see for the Hadean. Uh, the other thing is that I, I, I really would like people to start to consider and uh, evaluate whether or not Procolarum is not the oldest basin. Doesn't denigrate the value of South Pole Aiken because it's, you can get a date there probably more easily than you can for Procolarum. The Procolarum date of 4.33 is an indirect date based on, on other factors, but it, it is one of the largest basins. It's continental in scale like South Pole Aiken and the existence of continental scale basins on the Earth is also a very important part of the Hadean in developing uh, the seeds for the first continents through the crystallization of uh, melt sheets. Yeah. Okay, so there's three things there. Let me try to go through them quickly. Uh, I agree with uh, clays, but I would uh, suggest that clays actually might be uh, catalytic uh, uh, materials in a different way. These hydrothermal systems would have generated um, uh, clays that, such as montmorillonite like clays. It's something that we actually see in the hydrothermally altered rocks beneath Chicxulub. And Jim Ferris, who used to be, uh, who's since passed but was funded by NASA, found that the uh, uh, structure, the crystalline structure of montmorillonite actually catalyzed uh, a lot of um, uh, nucleic type chemistry. 
Um, so it would be, that would be chemistry that occurs in the subsurface as opposed in a shallow coastal sea type environment. Well, your clays are going to form in, everywhere, mm -hmm. I mean, if, and very rapidly in a water environment. We know that, surface as well as at depth. And so it may be hydrothermal, it may be at the surface uh, and moving around. Okay. Um, with, with regard to um, procol I, I have no, uh, I, I have no, I take no uh, sides or issues with that. Although I will say that I have an, I have an alternative hypothesis for the 4.32 uh, to 4.35 billion year old age. We've suggested that the South Pole Lake and Basin created a magmatic epoch at the antipode on the near side, and so that the zircon ages that we see that spike there are actually reflectant of South Pole Aiken Basin. And then the, the final thing that you said, oh, was about the size of the impacts that felt implied on the Earth. Yes, uh, so something on the order of 40 impact basins, 5,000 kilometers in diameter were produced on the Earth based on what we see on the Moon. Those were monsters. And their melt sheets were monstrous. And exactly. They also, melt sheets tend to differentiate, and you have some very old zircons coming yeah. from that. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Oh, okay, Clive. You're not getting off that lightly, David. Uh, um, I, I really like you, the way you presented that, because it implies we need to go to a lot of different places. And I got, I got two questions. Have you considered an architecture that could be replicated to bring down the cost? to bring these uh, samples back. We've seen some of the commercial providers suggest that yesterday. Um, it, 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 it then implies that you would need a regular cadence of missions, which fits into the business plans. Um, and the, the, you know, that's the first question. And the second one, which is sort of relevant, if you go to the younger craters, we can see the impact melts and know where to go. I wouldn't know, for example, Pro Solarum, where, where you would go to definitively show that you've got impact melt to do that. And some of the older basins become more of an issue, especially yeah. if they've been flooded with Mari yeah. basalts. Yeah. Any, any ways around that? Yeah, um, so I absolutely, for, so there's two questions. The first one, um, a common spacecraft bus, uh, a launch cadence in six months, <laughs> his eyes did go up, <laughs> would be great. Um, it would be a, it's a, it's just fantastic. I don't know if that's, that's at all possible, but uh, regular, Access to the lunar surface will obviously produce uh, results a lot faster. With regard to um, the sample selection, landing site selection process, this is one of the reasons that I uh, repeatedly advocate that we go to Schrodinger and Orientale first. Um, if we go to those two places, we are going to get impact basin melt and melt bearing material that has not been overprinted by later basin forming events. So you can see the range of melt textures that you might produce in a basin forming impact event. You can assess the homogeneity and heterogeneity of the melt chemistry that a single impact event occurs, uh, produces. You can evaluate the uh, amount of uh, a disparity in the class abundances within a, a basin forming event, a, a single one. Once you've done that at those relatively simple cases, then I think you can actually go to the more complicated basins, Nectaris, go back to Nectaris. You can actually even go back into the existing Apollo collection and I think make much smarter interpretations of those uh, more complicated sites. Okay, thank you. Thank you, David. All right, our next speaker is Dr. Mark Robinson and he will be talking about the Kronos program, unraveling the bombardment history of the inner solar system. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna give you the punchline. Just start off right here. I'm gonna make the whole planetary science community happy and NASA headquarters, and this includes Dave Kring. So by the time we get done. Okay, so what I wanna talk about is kind of bring together everything that people have been um, expressing their desire to get samples, and this is really how we can do it in a cost-effective manner. Very similar to what Dave just said is on a cadence that we're going to allow to get this done in our lifetimes. And, and you know, I'm not that young anymore, but we can do this. Okay, the rationale for the Kronos program 
is to determine the timing of key events on the moon and thus within the solar system by developing a sustainable lunar sample return program with future relevance to Mars sample return. See, we're even going to make the Mars sample return community happy. Um, the need is to understand conditions within the early solar system and the evolution of the moon. Our goals, well, we have a primary goal and a secondary goal, just keeping it simple here. Determine the age of formation of key landforms on the moon over a approximately four billion year period. It's a pretty impressive goal right there. And this will provide, by providing calibration points for the lunar crater and chronology, which are missing for uh, events greater than 3.8 billion years and for that broad period of three to one, and I would argue that maybe even down to zero. And well, we, right now we have unequivocal samples uh, from many large basins, or we don't have them in, in, in the collection, and we will um, fix that. Secondary goal is to determine the geochemical evolution of the moon over time. And these goals will be met through the following objectives is overarching and develop a cost-effective robotic system to collect and bring samples from multiple locations with return to Earth from a lunar orbiting asset. And that's the way we can make this happen, is we don't have to, every sample, have a return capsule, EDL, parachute, so on and so forth, which is what kills you in terms of mass and therefore cost. So the way we're going to do this is we're going to land safely and accurately within a plus or minus 100 meters of the assigned target, collect appropriate sample for radiometric age dating, store the sample in a sealed container, return sample to Earth in a pristine state, but really return it to uh, lunar orbit to be collected. Okay, this is potentially the most important plot in planetary sciences. I think we've seen some version of this in two, if not three talks already today. It's the lunar cratering chronology. Um, what you see in the background is, as presented in the review by Stofler and Ryder, 2001, and then uh, corrections have been made since 2001, um, in 2006 and 2012. Of course, most of you know this originated with Noikam and co-workers, and it's been getting tweaked ever since. Uh, it was pointed out, um, I think Dave did earlier, that there's this uh, large hiatus of data in here, but we actually we're not sure that we're actually identifying the basins correctly up here, okay? So, you know, the challenges that we're facing right now is the assignment of current samples to specific basin events, the effects of target properties, uh, including self-secondary cratering, on the crater size frequency distribution of young craters. Uh, the chronology, the existing chronology, is best defined by Framaro, Descartes, Mari Basalts, and Copernican craters. Um, but we do, you know, there is the extreme view that some take, and it's completely plausible, that we really only know the age of one basin on the moon, and that's Embryon. Okay? I'm agnostic on that. If Paul Spudis were here, unfortunately, he walked out of my talk. Um, <laughs> but this is you know, supporting a recent paper that he came out with. Okay, uh, and I don't really need to tell everybody here, but I'm going to anyways, the importance of crater size frequency distributions for getting, uh, and combined with the samples to get model ages. Um, this is a map that I think Dave also showed in your talk, right? Uh, culmination of 20 years-ish of Harry Hiesinger's work, uh, counting craters across Mari basalts, coming at crater size frequency distribution, so on and so forth. Um, but the assignment of absolute ages to these um, units, which are defined by uh, other means, by uh, remote sensing data, really depends on the precision and accuracy of the chronology function. And, and I would argue right now that there's way, way too much interpolation and extrapolation in these absolute model ages. It's not a criticism of the work that was done, it's just the lack of uh, definitive calibration points. So let's take care of that. So the basic concept of operations for the Kronos program is from lunar orbit, land precisely and safely, obtain and seal the relevant sample, document the sample area in the simplest way possible, and that may just be through photography, return the sample to an orbital asset for eventual Earth return, refuel that vehicle, and repeat and do this 10 times, 12 times, whatever we can engineer. 
And there's rumors that we're going to have assets in lunar orbit, be it Orion or this deep space gateway. Um, and so I would encourage the deep space gateway people right now to think about an orbit that's optimal for rendezvousing with uh, something coming up the surface of the moon. Okay, this is a potential landing site locations of a Kronos program that would address the full range of ages across the uh, surface of the moon, where we're, especially where we're having problems. And I think I'm going to make uh, Dave really happy. Um, Schrodinger is one of the targets. But of course, this is just an example. Probably if we divided this room up into 10 different groups, they would come up with 10 different answers, and all of them are equally valid, because the secondary goals might actually sway where you went to get the calibration points for the, uh, uh, for the chronology. And a key point of picking the sites is that it's a good place to take, you know, to, to collect the, uh, the crater counts, right? Because that's our, remember, that's our ultimate goal, is, is really nailing that crater size frequency distribution and going somewhere where you can definitively get the sample. And that's been talked about in a number of uh, previous talks, um, like Art Schrodinger. You can land on with an exposed melt sheet. Uh, Chrysium, there may be an exposed melt sheet on the, on the western side, Paul Spudis, Guys, I've called him out twice and he's not here. Although there is some equivocation whether that's really an exposed melt sheet or not. You cannot, Kronos program cannot successfully go to complicated sites like Taurus Latro. That's where humans are going to go. So we would work in conjunction with whatever. Actually, maybe at the end of the session today, Jim Green can tell us about what the future funding profile is like for lunar exploration, right? So this is just a map of that table showing the locations where I picked these uh, sites where we can actually go and get an easy sample. And it's got to be an easy sample. You set a, a lander down there, it has a scoop, maybe a sieve, puts it in a container, brings up 500 grams to a kilogram to orbit, and then uh, the, to keep it simple, the orbital asset would even grapple it. Because if you go and put a docking mechanism on this thing, the mass goes up, the cost goes up, you know, mass is everything. Okay, uh, what is the value of return samples? I'm not going to even talk about that, right? Because <laughs> I'm talking to preaching to the choir here. So I just wrote this, uh, see other talks at this meeting. The Skim Report, the NAC Meeting Report, Planetary Decadal Society, so on and so forth. Finally, corner Clive and ask him if sample return is useful. Yes. Okay, but you guys corner them and get that, you know, up close and personal, okay? So what kind of constraints are we talking about here? Well, of course, cost is the most important one, right? And um, you should be able to, cre to create the spacecraft for less than the cost of a New Frontiers mission if, if it's NASA-led. If it's private industry-led, maybe even the cost of a discovery mission. It's clearly not a $50 million spacecraft shouldn't be a $2 billion spacecraft. But even if it is New Frontiers mission, imagine you're getting samples from 10 places on the moon, or maybe even 12, however long it can last, okay? So the design lifetime, what's the next bullet, is I think you should have the, the design lifetime to be at least 10 round trips. Of course, you know, you've got to refuel it, obviously, um, in orbit. And you minimize the risk through minimalist design, no Christmas trees. I know the sci planetary science community is going to want to put a bunch of stuff on it, right? But no, because the gold is the sample, not the measurement you're going to take, right? Um, and then, as I mentioned earlier, mass is everything, you know, so no extras. You know, give the astronauts in the, well, oh, peace, yeah. Oh, two minutes, okay. Um, I thought you were just agreeing about the mass is everything stuff, okay. So, you know, as I mentioned earlier, you know, maybe the astronauts that are in the um, Deep Space Gateway need something to do. I mean, imagine how cool it would be and fun it would be for them to have a little arm on there and they, you know, rendezvous and they grapple the thing and, pu and put it in. And maybe even do a spacewalk and go get the container out and put the empty container in before it goes down. Okay, potential engineering feed forward benefits. Remember, I mentioned earlier that the Mars science community is going to like this, right? 
um, because we can perfect autonomous hazard avoidance to the terminal stage of descent. I know some of you think, well, it's different on Mars because you come through the atmosphere and everything. But that last 200 meters is not that different um, if you're uh, designing a spacecraft that looks for hazards and avoids them. Perfect sampling and sealing operations and the technology that goes along with it. Perfect return capsule capture by an orbital asset, which is oftentimes hinted as a part of a um, Mars sample return. And this would be either human or robotic control you know, from lunar orbit. And you know, I just wanted to point out, and, and almost all of you cannot see the bottoms of the slides here, so I'll just read it. A single Mars sample return mission is estimated to cost between 50, I mean between 5 and 20 billion. Maybe that was a Freudian slip. Maybe it will be 50 billion. Um, and so we better get all this stuff right because we can't screw up at Mars. Okay, uh, so what is the value of the Kronos program? Well, better known sample provenance. Um, we can expand the calibration of the curve, not really expand it, but just complete it all the way from uh, yesterday back to uh, 4 billion years. Explore the target property and self-secondary effects uh, in the areas where we count craters. So therefore, all of our crater counts everywhere else on the moon, Mars, Mercury become more valuable. Um, solve this question that's been elucidated in a couple of the talks about the uh, when and how long did, it, did we even have a cataclysm. And then the geochemistry we're going to get from this. You know, I'm not a geochemist, right? But imagine the geochemistry and all the advances we're going to make about how the moon uh, formed and evolved over time. And then, of course, the technology development for all sorts of other missions down the road. And it's a perfect complement to this human return to the moon, especially if we can utilize the Deep Space Gateway or some other long-lived asset in lunar orbit. So the final question I will close with, which you can't see right here because it's blocked by the tables, is how could we not proceed with the Kronos program? I think that was the last slide. I hope so, at least. Oh, no, this is the last slide. <laughs> and we can figure out when did I actually form, <laughs> right? OK, that's it. Thank you. Questions for Dr. Robinson? So um, Mark, there's elements of what you just described that um, has been explored by um, ESA and its partners. Um, in fact, James Carpenter, if he's still here, mentioned it briefly uh, yesterday. This is a Heracles concept, mm -hmm. which uses the Deep Space Gateway, uh, and a lander goes down to the surface. Um, there are, and a sample is collected. In this case, it's a little more complicated mission. It involves a rover, uh, collects samples, returns them to the lander, and then the ascent uh, portion of the lander uh, goes up the Deep Space Gateway, transfers the samples into the gate gateway, uh, and, in fact, the easiest way, it seems, is for the astronauts simply to grab the sample container and bring it back in. Uh, and then um, the, a new set of uh, landing legs is attached. It's refueled, and it goes back down to the, the lunar surface. The Heracles concept involves uh, three or four landings, uh, one landing per year. Yeah, it's, it's way more complicated, and it makes the vehicle much more expensive, and then you have to bring those extra stages with you as you, you know, in like a little warehouse, I guess, in the um, Deep Space Gateway. That would be where it would be stored. But if we could make that happen, make it happen that way, that'd be great. But I think we really need 10, 10 different places or more. So in, in your scenario, that we, the 10 different samples, do they come back on Orion, or do you have a single Earth return small capsule that they get fed into on the gateway, and then that independently comes home. Oh, no, they come back with, with some other asset. OK, which could be Orion, or it could be something else. Yeah, or both. Because okay. Orion would limit the orbit the orbits that the gateway would be in. And obviously, the orbit that the gateway is in affects the size of the land that you need. But the total delta V is the same for getting there and getting back. Yeah. yeah. That's right. And, and you know, if, you, if it, it turns out that there is no deep space gateway, which I don't know what's going to happen, and there's just Orion, you certainly couldn't do 10 missions on one uh, Orion to the moon. You know, it would be spread over. So then it gets a little bit more complicated because you would have to park in lunar orbit because you couldn't park on the surface of the moon because of, you know, all the added thermal considerations, power, so on and so forth. But even if you were using the gateway but you had a separate Earth return 
vehicle that you were loading up, the gateway still has the advantage of allowing you to refill your lander yes, to use it 10 times. Yes, right, yeah. And the gateway folks were kind of excited when I talked about this at the, whatever meeting we were at, oh, a NAC meeting, right. That, you know, the transfer of the hydrogen fuel would be relatively easy and it would give, give them something to do. So I confess I have a comment rather than a question, but I'm Josh Hopkins from Lockheed Martin. I just wanted to mention that we have looked at ideas like this with Orion and the Deep Space Gateway. There have been some papers we've published on the orbital mechanics of how you do rendezvous from the lunar surface up to halo orbits or NROs. And we've also looked at the mechanisms of how would you actually get one of these samples, do the, do the rendezvous and get the samples into the pressurized mm -hmm. vehicles and where do they get stowed in Orion. So I, I agree. it's. It's a feasible approach. Ten missions might be starting to push the budget a little bit, but there's certainly some fertile ground to continue exploring here. Yep. Okay, can I make an announcement? Yes. This is going to be shocking to everybody. I'm going to be a dad in three weeks. <laughs> First time. <laughs> All right, thank you. Congratulations. <laughs> All right, uh, <laughs> so we're going to go on to our next talk. Um, Dr. Barbara Cohen is gallivanting around Antarctica right now, collecting our next samples that we're all going to be analyzing, hopefully some from the moon, um, but uh, some asteroids from the moon, but, uh, or meteorites. OK, I'm going to keep going. So um, in her stead, Dr. Noah Petro is going to be presenting the onset of the cataclysm in situ dating of a near side basin impact melt sheet. All right, thank you. I did actually just talk to Barbara uh, this morning. She called during Tim Glotch's presentation. And when, when I guess you get a call from Antarctica, it comes up as being in Hawaii. And, and so initially, uh, when I first talked, are you sure you're in Antarctica, Barbara? <laughs> she, she assured me she is. And actually, this is a picture uh, from, I think, uh, from earlier, probably last week at this point, of uh, Barbara doing just that, collecting samples. So I told her, we're, we're having a workshop here. You don't actually have to go and do the, the sample collection and do sample return from Antarctica, but she insisted. Um, but, but so I'm, I'm delighted to talk on behalf of Barbara. Everything that I say that's wrong is my fault, and everything that's on the slides that's correct is, is Barbara's credit. And because Paul Spudis isn't here, we can blame him for everything else as well. Um, but actually, Paul does have a lot, of, a lot obviously, to, uh, to add to, to the discussion here. Um, also, as a note to the, the program committee, next time don't put the in situ age sample talk at the end of the sample return because I think we've seen some really elegant and eloquent presentations advocating for sample return. I think that is the ultimate goal. And what Barbara and her team are advocating for is in, in the case that you cannot do sample return, whether it be for cost, which ultimately is probably going to be the one reason why we wouldn't do sample return, um, what we can do from a, a landed in situ age dating mission. Uh, with that, let's move ahead. We've heard already many uh, very good presentations about lunar cataclysm and the, the case for un better understanding the, uh, the timing and chronology of, uh, of major lunar impacts. Um, David talked uh, about the uncertainty in, in age dates and understanding of where some of the samples from the Apollo and Luna sample collections, uh, what, what those are telling us. Uh, of course, there's major implications for understanding not just the age, but what it means for what's been going on in the solar system. As David mentioned, this is solar system science done on the surface of the moon. Um, and of course, there are the, the, you know, lunar science of this scale is planetary science, is Earth science. And so understanding what was happening in our corner of the solar system at this very early stage of, of planetary um, uh, history. So you know, we want to have a, a better understanding of what was happening on and around the moon about 3.9 or 3.9 billion years ago and what the implications of that are for, for everything else. OK, but of course, what if there was no cataclysm? What if we've been wrong all this time? How do we reconcile that? And so of course, the sample work that's been going on now for the last 50 years almost um, has been um, reevaluated in some of the recent workshops. The, the you know, understanding of where samples come from uh, and, and tying the samples of the, from the Apollo sites to their host basins has been um, an ongoing project, of course, fraught with some interpretation and some conflict amongst the community members. But however, uh, what we would like to be able to do is, is better understand 
the samples in situ, go to the basin instead of relying on material ejected from, from some great distance. Um, as David also mentioned, and this was a good, very good pre, uh, preclude or pre, uh, predecessor to this talk, was the idea that if we can get the in situ age of a particular basin, that allows us to focus our study on the samples that we have and perhaps identify those samples in the collection and give them their, their correct source. So how do we resolve this? Um, not, nothing that I say here today or what Barbara would say in future presentations of this kind would, kind would preclude South Pole Aiken sample return. It remains one of the, the critical uh, time horizons on the, 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 on the moon and for the inner solar system. And so understanding the age of that enormous basin is going to remain critical. Um, however, there are other basins that are going to represent an important time slice in, in lunar history as well. And so we focus on understanding the age of both the Nectaris and, and Christian basins and uh, again putting them into their proper chronological context. So as um, has been mentioned before, we, we, we believe we've, uh, or at least the mapping work that Paul has done has, has identified surface exposures of impact melt in uh, the Nectaris Basin. We've identified that here on the, in the figure. Um, there are several large uh, potential landing site sites within the, the uh, inner rings of, of, uh, of Nectaris that would provide ample opportunity for us to land and determine their, uh, the ages of that material in situ. And the same goes for Chrysium, as, as um, Mark pointed out, there is some, some debate as to whether or not these are impact melts or not. Um, we can certainly discuss that and look into that further, but if, if these are indeed in situ uh, impact melts from this basin, they would provide a ample opportunity for us to land there and, uh, and, sam and date those materials. So, uh, you know, one of the benefits of, of identifying these, these uh, impact melt deposits and, uh, and identifying safe landing sites with them is that it allows us to go and, and scoop, sieve, and, and determine the, the, the ages of multiple fragments in the regolith um, and, 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 of course, come up with a, a defined age from that. Um, it's important to, to not only remind everyone but just to really hammer home the point that these impact melt sheets are going to be fundamentally different than the Apollo landing sites were, that we don't have the, the same experience in landing in this type of environment uh, of course, the lunar environment we have experience in landing in, but we don't have experience in landing in melt sheets. It's not going to be necessarily the same problems that we run into. As Barbara likes to remind me all the time, you know, nobody argues that Apollo 16 didn't sample Highlands crust. There's Highlands crust they sampled there because they landed in the Highlands. If you land on MRA, uh, an impact melt sheet, you're going to get impact melt in that material. And so this uh, famous figure showing uh, with a one centimeter grid shows the, the, the diversity of materials that would be uh, scooped and sieved from, from within a regolith and would provide ample material for us to uh, just determine the ages of um, on the surface. This is, uh, I, it was dutiful and Barb wanted me to show this slide. I, I resisted a little bit because this highlights work of mine from when I was a wee laddie with Carly, before the real laddie came along, I guess. Um, but it shows the evolution for a site in, in South Pole Lake and going from essentially the you know, formation of the impact uh, of South Pole Lake and through time, Barb and I have worked on identifying sort of the, the, the primary candidates for introducing material. And when I say material, that's ejecta. And we don't differentiate between ejected material and melted material ejected by these craters. It's, quote, contamination. Of course, this is good contamination because this adds diversity to any of the landing sites. But starting on the, let's see, house left, my right, going uh, forward in time from Essentially, let's do the experiment. Right, here we go from 100% SPA impact melt, and it gets diluted over time as subsequent impacts come in. It introduces this foreign material. That material mixes as we get larger events, and let's see if this works, such as Serenitatis that comes in, mixes to depth, and brings up that SPA, that, that sort of basement material, mixes it and re uh, sort of undilutes it by bringing up material from greater depths. Uh, this mixing process will reintroduce more material so we're not uh, hiding or, or masking that original uh, SPA impact melt. So landing on an impact melt gives us the chance to get the original material, the floor material, but then that, as well as this other added component. And so through time, we add these major events and um, uh, these events are going to be recorded in the regolith. And so this mixing dilution, but then sort of deeper excavation and bringing up that, 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 that original material 
gives us a sense that we'll have at least 50% or more of that original floor material, that original melt sheet material uh, in the regolith. Okay, so how would we do this? And so uh, for those of you that have heard Barbara talk over the last several years, she has been working on developing some um, analytical capabilities that we're getting uh, set up at uh, Goddard now. Uh, we're very excited for, for that capability. She's also working on uh, smaller uh, uh, instruments that can be used in a, in a in situ uh, age dating mission. So we're talking about potassium argon geochronology using uh, Lib's mass spectroscopy. Um, basically, you know, she's outlined a, a series of, of measurements that we can do, and I'll talk a little bit about how this would fit into various sized missions. But the bottom line is that this uh, approach receive, uh, re returns a precision of about a plus minus 100 to 150 million year uh, age for a, bill for a four billion year sample. Now again, this is not anywhere near what we can get in a sample return to the Earth, but if we can land on a site, again, this would point us in the right direction of what we might look for in, our, in an existing sample collection. So for the baseline mission, a focus mission to do this, we could have uh, a very robust set of uh, collection and delivery mechanisms that have been studied not just going back to Apollo, but also as part of the Moonrise concept development. Uh, the LIB system, a mass spectrometer, microscopic imager to really characterize those regular samples, uh, possibly a, a LIDAR not only to assist with descent and landing, but also to characterize the workspace as we, we scoop and sieve. Um, this would be a 35 kilogram package, which would be um, suitable for, for a full up mission or inclusion on a, on a commercial payload. Um, again, this does not include power, comm, things like that as well. We scale that back a little bit, get down to a smaller payload for, for maybe a different type of mission, still keeping the sample collection and delivery mechanism, but again going to a, a sort of a reduced set of instruments. We have the LIBS to get potassium for chronology, a mass spec for argon, um, and a microscopic imager again to characterize the samples. Um, uh, lastly, on a, the most reduced option is just the LIBS and mass spectrometer. Uh, that requires, this? oh no, that way, right, that's right, that's, that's not the right way to do that. Um, and, and so with this payload, this would be in a much more scaled down, but still would return the, uh, the uh, necessary information uh, if we can get right up against the surface. Uh, and just to highlight the, the um, accuracy and the, the sort of how well this system works, um, you know, th this is from a multiple laboratories worth of work to get whole rock ages within uh, appropriate errors. This uh, approach is at uh, TRL-4 and so we're working to improve that capability and hopefully be able to, uh, to fly it soon. And let's see, okay, so just as a, a sort of a, in summation, you know, as was pointed out before, this is solar system wide. The implications of determining the ages of these basins has implications for the entire solar system. Um, it gives us not only a characterization of the sample, but also the landing site as well. Uh, we are not envisioning mobility requirements for this as a single lander. Uh, just on the near side, sub-equatorial point, so we have direct line of sight uh, communication with the Earth. These sites that we're proposing have been covered by uh, the LROC NACs, and so we have adequate data to characterize potential landing sites. Uh, this does advance our investments for in situ geochronology for not just going to the moon, but of course sending uh, other places in the solar system. Uh, all of the, the goals of the, such a mission are, are directly address uh, decadal survey science. Don't have to go through this. We've almost probably at this point all memorized some of these uh, goals, but uh, such a landed mission would give us a, a really important uh, toehold in understanding not just the chronology, compositions of basalts and other material, because again, the regolith samples at these sites will give us a little bit of regional context as well. Um, and we'll be able to characterize large landing sites through ground truth um, uh, measurements. And let's see, and so here's just a, a notional sense of the operations uh, through landing, scooping, sieving, and, uh, and sample measurements. I'm not going to necessarily walk through this, but I'll leave it up and hopefully have some time for some questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Noah? There we go. Um, you cited uh, an uncertainty uh, on the measurement uh, for four billion year age range of around, what, 150 million, something mm -hmm. like that. On the diagram that uh, plotted the LIBS ages versus the reference ages, there were no error bars at all on most of those points. Does that imply that the errors, uncertainties on those are less than the size of those symbols? That seems counterintuitive to me, especially for the really young ones. 
the older you get, the, it ought to get better. I will ask Barbara that All question. All right, fair enough. But uh, I, I imagine, well, I have no idea, actually. I'm I, just I, will not, I will not BS that answer fair because enough. I will do a disservice to I, I'm just that, curious but, whether if you're measuring something uh, younger, maybe Justin knows uh, that you have a larger uncertainty. So let me get out of the Justin, go ahead. I think that actually those are averages of, of multiple measurements, and so it's a function of averaging, too. So it's, it's complicated by those two things. So you should look at the, the uncertainty that they're showing of 100 million years as a, as a percentage of 4 billion, and then you can basically extrapolate. Thank you. So I, I, I don't like to criticize Barb, and it's completely unfair since she's not here to actually address the criticism, but look, impact lithologies, <laughs> That's right. yeah. in, impact lithologies are incredibly complex. Um, we have samples that Jack picked up, and they have been in our labs for 45 years, and we're still arguing mm -hmm. on what the ages mean. And so I just have no confidence in doing in situ analyses of these types of lithologies. They need to come back to Earth. <coughs> Said another way, it's only three days away. It's damn embarrassing if we can't get the samples back. I will not. Uh, I will not debate that point. It definitely. Uh, we've demonstrated that it's uh, feasible to do to return samples, and the Soviets have shown that you can do it robotically. And here we are, 2018, no flying cars, and still haven't been had a sample return mission in my lifetime. And I'm not that old. Well, I feel old every day. It takes longer to get the rocks back from Antarctica. <laughs> yeah. Harley. I, I was just gonna. I mean, I'm very for sample return, obviously, but uh, just to push back a little bit, I don't think it has to be one or the other, and I don't think that's the point here. Uh, I think this is, a, you know, a, a parallel um, type of approach, and obviously, like a lot of the other discussions we've had, we're thinking about, you know, technology developments for other targets to, like Mars, which is not three days away, et cetera, et cetera. So let's keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. Um, from our discussion earlier today, isn't it obvious where the best way to test this and show whether it works or not is to go to Ina? I mean, that if it can't tell us the answer there, I mean, and and geez, <laughs> it's an obvious and it's a win. You know, it's it's a simple. Just go do it, demonstrate it. Great science and. And then you can refine it if you want to, but you know, all we need to know is yes. No. Yeah. It's not rocket science, except that it is. But it's not. It's rock science. Um, I, I just want to. Do we have time, or I, we do? Speak, come, tell us, so, share your thoughts, session chair. So very, very briefly, um, I have some bad news. Our next speaker is ill, so. The good news to soften that blow is that we can use this time for a discussion. So continue. <laughs> and we don't have to just have me getting discussed no. at. I don't want to. No, no, no. This should be open to everybody, but all of I, the previous speakers. And <laughs> perhaps this is a discussion over beverages later on, David. And, and will you, you come on up? You're part of this panel, so you can come. But the, the, the comment that, uh, you know, as we heard and heard from Jack, the debate over now four and a half decades about the, the, the samples that we have. Oh, you can stand up and look over my shoulder. It's okay. Um, I would make the argument, and, and Barbara wanted to make the argument, that these you know, exposures of impact melter are, are different contexts than what we explored uh, in Apollo. If we sent Apollo 17 to one of these deposits, we wouldn't be having this debate about the age of these basins, but, but we didn't. Did really well. So I would I would say yes. If you went to Schrodinger or you went to Orientale, I think you can make that argument. You go to these ponds of Chrysium and Nectaris. I think the argument is harder to make because a lot more impact history has occurred after those events. I mean, Apollo 16 was supposed to be Nectaris ejecta, and it looks like it may be Embryum ejecta. Okay, Island that that too. means Embryum ejecta is probably on the ponds that have been mapped as Nectaris impact melt. You know, we, what the proportions are, I don't know, but it's going to be messy again. And doing that robotically in situ 
is a recipe for an uncertain answer. And we have had 45 years of uncertain answers. I would really like to get definitive <laughs> answers and start to retire the uncertainties on these hypotheses. So um, to, not to stop the discussion, but I want to encourage um, some of our commercial people here if you have any questions that some of these talks today so far have engendered in you, please feel free to get up and, and ask questions specifically on, you know, if, if you need some information that we're not providing for you, please get up and ask those questions. This is a good time to do that. Okay, Clive. If we, if we uh, just to sort of segue from that, if you look at the commercial um, opportunity, sample return is, is in the future. Um, it's maybe not that far in the future, but, but getting payloads to the surface of the moon is certainly um, closer than that. So if we come up, and part of the goal, goals of this is are to say, well, you know, the immediate missions that would do in situ science, that could deliver payloads to do in situ science or set up monitoring networks, um, would be, be some of the low-hanging fruit in terms of um, missions that could be done soon. So putting that into this in-situ versus sample return debate, um, there are significant um, scientific gains to be made by doing some of these in-situ um, analyses. And I think what we have to do is to identify those landing sites or those areas that we need to explore. And I would like each of the panelists up there to sort of give, give one or two examples where they think in-situ would be good to do um, in the next five years. Okay, so my answer is um, not uh, in the session that we've just had. My answer for in situ science is to do volatiles. That's, it's volatiles you want to do in situ. You don't want to be collecting the sample, go through all the trouble trying to bring it back. I mean, eventually we do. But you, you, mass spectrometers are relatively easy instruments to build. They've been on a lot of different spacecraft. Uh, so I would target a, a site with volatiles and try to do some in situ analyses. I agree. I mean, I just gave a talk about in situ age. So I'm not going to throw Barb's presentation or my presentation under the bus. But I think, I mean, there's a number of questions. And maybe we could do, you, you could go to one of the, the uh, uh, silicic uh, features that appears to have an enhancement in, uh, in hydration. Get, I mean, a different flavor of pol than polar volatiles. You can go to the pyroclastic deposits. I mean, all of the, you can it's, make it, an it's, argument. It's as, as Mark said, we could get 10 different places that we want to go. Right. But it's not an either or. But, no. But, but no. Let's, let's, let's think about this in terms of in situ science. What's a home run? Volatiles, we've heard. All right. We've heard Ina would be a place mm -hmm. to go to answer the question. That's my answer. All right. And that's, uh, and so, Noah, don't waffle. I, I know it is my answer. I mean, obviously, I, I'm involved in both of those concepts that I talked about in my, when my surrogate talks. Surrogate was a great word, by the way. Uh, so it's, it's low-hanging fruit, as you say. Carly hit it, the nail on the head. I know you go. It doesn't matter whether the uncertainty is 150 or 400 million right. years old. You're going to know whether it's ancient or young. Box check. Yep. Yeah, I, I mean, and then certainly for understanding the thermal history of the moon, it would be nice to know. We always worry about the right-hand side of any time plots for future missions. What about the right-hand side plot of volcanism on the moon? That would be important. But um, I, whether it's chronology or volatiles, you know, I, there's maybe not a, a center of that Venn diagram. But I think if, if I had to do it, I might go for a, a, an in situ volatiles uh, measurement. So, so you, this, this is the point, is that when we sit down and start thinking about it based upon the presentations we've heard, and our, and our corporate knowledge that's gathered here. It, it sort of starts to, you know, th that, those types of things are what Jim needs um, and be the product from this, this meeting. So let's keep thinking that way. Sure, Clive, I understand that. But um, look, sample return was done robotically, we've heard <laughs> repeatedly <laughs> 45 years ago. We shouldn't put that too far down the road, okay? Right. And I am very worried that if we just simply make a list of things to do in situ, we are never going to start bringing samples back. You are, you, you're, you're missing the point. Of course, we, we, we want samples. I want samples. We all want samples. But the thing is, is that 
We need to have, this, this is our in situ list, this is our sample return list for things to do, places to go. We've got justifications for the in situ. We've got great justifications for the sample return. It's not an either or, it's, it's not kicking the can down the road. No, no, no. We, we, we've got to we come up with options because this addresses not only the science no, but the exploration no, goals. No, I, I disagree. I mean, having spent a little bit of life in business, what you're, you're going to be driven by the market. If the market is going to be satisfied with you simply doing lots of in situ science, you're not going to be investing in the technology to bring the sample back and get the price down on bringing the sample back. No, you're not. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to suggest slightly thinking differently about the entire subject. Uh, what this discussion is, is basically rationing scarcity. Sample return emissions are expensive. Uh, the amount of money that Jim and SMD has is limited. Um, if we are doing everything robotically, if, as the new administration wants to do, is to land on the moon, and we have an outpost on the moon, and if what we want to do is to get water for propellant depots and all, there is a very low-cost way at that point to do every single one of your missions. A suborbital hop from an outpost or a base where there is lunar water will cost probably $5 million, $10 million, whatever your instrument is. Uh, if we're doing it from the Earth, it's 250, it's 300, it's 500 million dollars. LRO is a billion dollars. Mm -hmm. These sample return missions as robotic only missions are expensive. But if they are done within the context of a human presence on the moon at an outpost that has other activities such as industrialization and the acquisition of water from uh, the PSRs, for a propellant depots, which a lot of people, um, you know, there's a guy named uh, Bezos is putting a billion dollars a year into that right now. Uh, there's a guy named Musk putting a lot of money into going to Mars. If we think a little differently about this, let's, let's have a, at least one alternative <coughs> scenario to where if we have an outpost and we have suborbital hoppers, we can solve all your problems in Absolutely. a couple of years. Totally. I totally agree with that, Dennis. I mean, and this goes back to what we've heard from other speakers about, uh, I think Pascal said it, you know, you start with having some permanent infrastructure. And the beauty, of course, that you didn't mention is you get humans in, involved with sample collection and understanding what's going on on the ground, and we've seen how that pays off. So I would, I would love to see it done that way. I just want to make a quick clarification. You said that LRO is a billion-dollar mission, and that's not the case. Uh, it's Mark. Four hundred and sixty million. Four hundred sixty million M. Notice he said. Um, uh, uh, what's that? We'd love a billion. Oh, yeah, we would. Yeah, we would. Um, and I, I, I don't know if it was a slip of the tongue, but you also said sample return missions. We will. You know, one is not going to answer the mail. Answer all these questions. We have a lot. It's going to be the first in the Chrono series. It's, we want. And I'll, I'll not say want because we're greedy. We want because it's waiting there three days away for fundamental questions of planetary, earth and planetary science, waiting there. One site is not going to do it. Um, it's return missions, plural. All right. That's great. Is there any other questions going on? Wait the awkward 10 seconds. All right, I think lunch is just about ready. <laughs> Let's thank our speaker. Oh. It, it, it'll be ready at 1230, but the okay. original scheduled time. All right, so and you have I, 10 minutes. One, um, James has one, a question. Yes. Sorry, just one right. comment. Um, in 2014, in ETA, uh, we had a workshop on the science and challenges of lunar sample return. Um, just because my office is full of them and I need to get rid of them, I bought a bunch of the pamphlets that we produced <laughs> afterwards with me to distribute. So in the poster room, I put a bunch of them on a table, and um, so help yourselves. Great. Thank, Thank you, James. You. And I have one other announcement to make. Um, we still have four lightning round talks this afternoon, slots that are open. So if anybody who has a poster wants to get up and give their two-minute talk, go to the front desk um, at reception and, and sign up. We want to fill those spots and take advantage of this opportunity. All right, you've got 10 minutes to lunch, so talk amongst yourselves. Get ready. And thank you, all our speakers, for this morning.